All right. So, yes, uh, very good evening, everyone. So I am myself, uh, Dr. Rajesh Gubba. I'm the general medicine educator. So like uh, this will be the third part of the general medicine remarkable rapid revision. So before this, I have done the remarkable rapid revision in the two parts, that is part one and as well as part two. So if you take the part two of my session, I have just uh, ended with uh, the cardiology in the middle of the cardiology i have just uh, stopped now in this particular third part uh, what i'll be discussing is the remaining part of the cardiology whichever is due in part two and as well as i'll be discussing the gastroenterology so in the gastroenterology i'll be discussing the hepatology and uh, as well as the gastrointestinal tract abnormalities as well okay right now yes so please tell me quickly am i audible and visible to all of you Yes, I hope I'm audible and visible to all of you. All right. Now let us start with the session. So in the previous session, if you just take, like I was discussing about the arterial pulse in the cardiology. So in this particular session, I'll be discussing about the cardiac murmurs. So now can anyone identify what is this particular murmur? So which condition do you have this murmur? Iotic regurgitation, ASD, transposition of the great arteries and branched pulmonary artery stenosis. Any one of you? So basically, you need to identify what is this murmur, first of all. What exactly is this murmur? Is it systolic murmur or is it a diastolic murmur or is it a continuous murmur? Any one of you? Yes. So this is a... I'm just keep right. So this is a continuous murmur and now you should be able to make out among the options which has been given to you where exactly do you have the continuous murmur so among the options which has been given to you the continuous murmur no 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 in aortic regurgitation what is the murmur that you will have is the early diastolic murmur and in asd as such you don't have the murmur but a patient with asd if they develop pulmonary hypertension then the murmur that you can have is the ejection systolic murmur. Then in case of the transposition of the great arteries, you don't have any continuous murmur, but it is in case of the branched pulmonary artery stenosis where you have the presence of the continuous murmurs. It is not TGA as well, right? So it is mainly the branched pulmonary artery stenosis where you have the presence of the continuous murmur. So if you take the continuous murmur, the very common condition that we read in our books is like PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. Then next important condition is RSOV, that is ruptured sinus of the valsalva. And the another condition is, it is not TGA, but is in, seen in case of the truncus arteriosus, you have the presence of the continuous murmur. And you also have the continuous murmur in patients with the AV fistula, right? That is your peripheral AV fistula or even in case of the coronary AV fistula, you have the presence of the continuous murmurs, all right? Then you also have the continuous murmur whenever there is localized arterial obstruction. What is that localized arterial obstruction is? That is in patients with the coactation of iota, 
you have the presence of the continuous murmur and even in patients with carotid occlusion you have the continuous murmurs okay and among the options which has been given to you where do you have this continuous murmur is that is localized arterial obstruction that is branched pulmonary artery stenosis then yeah now you just see the next uh, image and please tell me where do you come across this murmur and first of all please identify this murmur yes please identify this murmur so is it like systolic or is it a diastolic if it is like systolic is it early systolic mid systolic or pan systolic or is it late systolic murmur what type of murmur is this the image which has been given to you so the image which has been given to you it is suggestive of the pan systolic murmur and among the options which has been given to you where is that you will have this pan systolic murmur you will have the pan systolic murmur in patients with a ventricular septal defect and what are the other conditions where you have pan systolic murmur where the murmur is present throughout the systole you get that in case of mr you get that in case of tr and you also get this in patients with the ventricular septal defect where you have this pan systolic murmur next and uh, right and you see the next condition please just observe this particular image and what type of murmur is this first you should be able to identify what is this murmur and then you can answer this question so there is a click in the mid part of the systole and followed by that there is a murmur in the later part of the systole so it is like uh, mid systolic click right it is like mid systolic click along with mid systolic click you have the presence of late systolic murmur so can anyone tell me in which condition do you have this mid systolic click with late systolic murmur so mid systolic click with late systolic murmur right very very good kailash so that is in case of the mbps that is mitral valve prolapse syndrome whereas you take all other conditions you take venous hum the murmur that you will have in case of the venous hum is the continuous murmur right and same is even in case of the coarctation of iota here also you have the presence of the continuous murmur and what about in case of iota pulmonary window iota pulmonary window it is like connection between the systemic artery and as well as the pulmonary artery so whenever there is a connection between the systemic artery and as well as the pulmonary artery the blood is moving from high pressure area to a low pressure area that will happen throughout the systole and diastole and that will also result in what is called the continuous murmur so only in first option mbps you have mid systolic click with late systolic murmur the other three options that is bcd you have the continuous murmur okay right now condition shown except so first of all again you should be able to identify the murmur right because the question asked is except in which condition you don't have this particular murmur is like question aortic stenosis pulmonary stenosis hocm tricuspid stenosis please identify the murmur right so if you see the murmur here it is the mid systolic murmur right or this is also called as the ejection systolic murmur mid systolic murmur or ejection systolic murmur so mid systolic murmur or ejection systolic murmur you have that in aortic stenosis you have that in pulmonary stenosis and you also have that in hocm as well but not in case of the tricuspid stenosis in tricuspid stenosis the murmur that you will have is the mid diastolic murmur so what is the answer here now the answer is the tricuspid stenosis where you don't have the mid systolic murmur or ejection systolic murmur but in the first three options you have the presence of the mid or ejection systolic murmur right yes next is about the diastolic murmurs so until now what all we have discussed is continuous murmurs we have discussed pan systolic murmur we have discussed mid systolic murmur we have discussed late systolic murmurs then coming to the diastolic murmurs that is early diastolic murmur and as well as the mid diastolic murmur yeah early diastolic murmur is seen in which clinical condition among the options which has been given to you so the early diastolic murmur among the options which has been given to you is present in vsd asd ms ar so you have that in case of the aortic regurgitation whereas you take in case of vsd it is pan systolic murmur and in asd as such you don't have any murmur only when there is development of pulmonary hypertension you have the development of the murmur and then coming to the ms that is mitral stenosis in mitral stenosis the murmur that you will have is the mid diastolic murmur whereas in ar you have early diastolic murmur 
And what are the other conditions where you have early diastolic murmur apart from AR is you also have early diastolic murmur in case of the PR, that is pulmonary regurgitation also, you have the early diastolic murmur. And next is the after early diastolic murmur, you need to be very much aware of the conditions where you have mid-diastolic murmur, that is in MS and as well as TS. So let me just quickly summarize the murmurs. So continuous murmurs, you see that in patients with patent ductus arteriosus, then ruptured sinus of Valsalva, then you get this in case of the truncus arteriosus, iota pulmonary window, AV fistula, coronary AV fistula, then branched pulmonary artery stenosis. You also have that in coactation of iota, carotid occlusion, then venous hum, then mammary softle. These are all the conditions where you have continuous murmurs. Then coming to systolic murmurs. Pan-systolic murmur, you have that in case of MR, then in case of the TR, and then in case of VSD, right? Then... Uh, you take early systolic murmurs. Early systolic murmurs, you have that in acute AR. The, I'm sorry. Early systolic murmurs, you have that in acute MR, right? Acute TR and small VSD. Then you take the mid-systolic murmur. You have that in AS, then HOCM, then PS. You have these three conditions, the mid-systolic murmurs. And diastolic murmurs, this is what is your diastolic murmurs, all right? Now, very important thing in the cardiology murmurs is the named murmurs. This slide is very, very important. Where is that you have Karikum's murmur? That is an acute rheumatic fever. And Karikum's murmur is what? It is the mid-diastolic murmur. And it is a functional murmur. Then coming to the Austin Flynn murmur. You see that in case of severe aortic regurgitation. And this is also a mid-diastolic murmur. Next is Graham Steele's murmur. That is observed in pulmonary regurgitation. And this is an early diastolic murmur. And next is retained murmur, which is observed in the complete heart block. And this is the diastolic murmur. Right? Then docs murmur, which is observed in left anterior descending artery stenosis. This is also a diastolic murmur. And next is the milvi murmur, which is seen in case of the air emboli. Okay? So this is about your cardiac murmurs. So in the previous session, if you see, like I have discussed all the general topics, like uh, in part two, of remarkable rapid revision. I have discussed the pulse. I have discussed the JVP, jugular venous pulse. And I have also discussed about the heart sounds. And in this particular session, the cardiac murmur is done. Then we will move on to the valvular lesions. The valvular lesions that you need to be very much aware of is the mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, and aortic regurgitation. Okay. Now, can anyone tell me what is the area of the mitral orifice in adults? Yes, area of the mitral orifice in adults. So if you take the area of the mitral orifice in adults, that is around four to six centimeters square is the area of the mitral orifice in adults. But you take in patients with mitral stenosis, what will happen to the area of the mitral orifice? That will be less than two centimeters square is in the adults. Okay. Now you need to know the CVRT of the mitral stenosis depending upon the valve area. If suppose, if the valve area is like 1.5 to 2, centimeter square, we call it as the progressive mitral stenosis. And if suppose, if the valve area, if it is in between 1 to 1.5, severe mitral stenosis, and if the valve area is less than 1 centimeter square, then it is called as the very severe mitral stenosis. And can anyone tell me what is the most common cause of the mitral stenosis? Right? The most common cause for mitral stenosis will be the rheumatic fever. Right? And what are the other causes for your mitral stenosis is connective tissue disorders, which will cause mitral stenosis is systemic lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis. And we have a storage disorder, which will be causing, right? A storage disorder, which will be causing the mitral stenosis, that is accumulation of the mucopolysaccharides, which is nothing but your Hurler syndrome, where you can have the development of the mitral stenosis. Okay. Now, you need to be very much aware of the auscultation in patients with the mitral stenosis. The auscultation, if you observe in mitral stenosis, the first heart sound will be loud in patients with mitral stenosis, right? And how will be your second heart sound? In the second heart sound, you have two components, A2 and as well as P2. The P2 will be loud. And why is that P2 is being loud? That is because of development of pulmonary hypertension in patients with the mitral stenosis. And... In the entire diastole, there are three additional sounds. One is your opening snap, which is being heard in the early part of the diastole. Then in the mid part of the diastole, in patients with mitral stenosis, you have the mid-diastolic murmur 
and in the later part of the diastole what is that you have is the pre systolic accentuation so these three are the additional sounds that you have in patients with mitral stenosis in the diastole and this mid diastolic murmur what has been very commonly asked is the pitch of the murmur so it is usually a low pitched murmur which is being heard at the apex of the precordium right that is about your mid diastolic murmur and what exactly are the complications of the mitral stenosis is one is your atrial fibrillation and why is this that is because of the left atrial enlargement the atrial fibrillation can happen then dysphagia why is this this is again because of left atrial enlargement that will be compressing the esophagus that will be causing dysphagia and the left atrial enlargement will also be compressing the airways that is trachea and that will result in the wheeze and what is this ortner syndrome that is enlarged left atrium right left atrial enlargement will be compressing the recurrent laryngeal nerve and that will result in what is called the hoarseness of voice and this hoarseness of voice secondary to mitral stenosis is what is called as the ortner syndrome and you need to know how to diagnose the patient with the mitral stenosis so coming to the diagnosis right uh yes sai chandan this is like rapid revision right so uh, we will be going little fast only because it is a rapid revision right and i'll be sending you this pdf once the session is over right so not to worry about that now coming to the diagnosis of the mitral stenosis so if you see the diagnosis one is by your ecg ecg will show you the presence of the p mitral right p mitral what do you mean by the word p mitral is if you if you take the shape of the p wave right it will be of m shape hmm? it will be of m shape that is what is called as the p mitral and what are the other investigations are the chest x ray so if you take the chest x ray in these patients you will observe that there is straight left heart border in patients with left heart border lhb is left heart border okay <laughs> and why is this straight left heart border that is because of the left atrial enlargement all right and not only that you will also observe the prominent pulmonary artery and why is this prominent pulmonary artery the prominent pulmonary artery is mainly because of development of the pulmonary hypertension and another very important finding in the chest x ray in patients with mitral stenosis is double density sign right that is double density sign so what is this particular double density sign why is this that is because of the enlargement of the left atrium so due to left atrial enlargement you have this particular double density sign and next very important is 2d echo so in the 2d echo what all you will be able to make out is you will be able to make out the mitral valve area and depending upon the mitral valve area you need to decide the cvrt of the mitral stenosis which i have discussed in the beginning of the topic of mitral stenosis but very important is the hockistic appearance and why is this hockistic appearance in mitral stenosis with Uh, in 2D echo is that is because of restricted anterior mitral valve leaflet mobility. That is what will give you the hockistic appearance. Now, at the same time, can anyone tell me where do you get the hockistic appearance in the ECG? Any one of you? All right, hockistic appearance in the ECG. Yes, hockistic appearance in the ECG. Any one of you? So, if you see the hockistic appearance in the ECG, you observe that in patients with digoxin effect. Okay, in patients with digox, I mean, in patients who are taking digoxin, the digoxin effect is what will give you hockistic appearance. And what exactly is that? That is ST segment depression. So the ST segment depression that you observe in case of digoxin effect, it appears similar to that of a hockey stick, and that is what is called hockey stick appearance. So two points now: hockey stick appearance in the 2D echo, that is mitral stenosis; hockey stick appearance in the ECG, that will be your digoxin effect. Now coming to the treatment in patients with the mitral stenosis, asymptomatic patients. they don't usually require the treatment but agar if the patient is symptomatic because of the mitral stenosis then you need to restrict the sodium intake and as well as you need to give the oral doses of the diuretics or oral diuretics should be given and along with that along with the uh, oral diuretics you also need to add the beta blockers right you also need to add the beta blockers but very important is like the surgical treatment What is the surgical treatment that you do in patients with mitral stenosis? We have two options. 
one is your pbmv right and the other one is mbr that is mitral valve replacement okay now you need to know what exactly is the procedure which has been shown to you here which procedure is being done in the image shown which procedure is being done in the image shown any one of you the options are percutaneous mitral balloon valvotomy valvuloplasty mitral valve repair coronary intervention so what do you think is it so the procedure whichever has been shown it is nothing but the valvotomy that is percutaneous mitral balloon valvotomy that is pbmv now what is the indication for your pbmv is if the patient is having severe mitral stenosis along with that the clinical features are there then you need to do the pbmv all right and at the same time you need to be very much aware of the contraindications of the pbmv the contraindications of pbmv are number 1 calcified mitral stenosis you should not do pbmv right and if there is presence of left atrial thrombus right if there is presence of left atrial thrombus then you should not do pbmv these two are the contraindications for pbmv so in these two conditions what is that we need to do is we we do the surgical mitral valve replacement okay so that is about your mitral stenosis story now after having discussed about the mitral stenosis we'll move on to the next topic that is mitral regurgitation so mitral regurgitation what exactly is that it is the regurgitation of the blood from the left ventricle to the left atrium during the systole and the regurgitation occurs throughout the systole because the regurgitation occurs throughout the systole that is the reason why you, the murmur that you get here is the pan systolic murmur what you get in patients with the mitral regurgitation and at the same time you need to be very much aware of what are the etiologies that are causing the mitral regurgitation you have primary and as well as the secondary mr out of this primary means where the pathology is within the valve one of the very very important example is the mitral valve prolapse secondary mr means the pathology is not in the valve per se but the pathology it will affect the mitral valve apparatus like for example coronary artery disease which coronary artery disease that is anterior wall mi or the inferior wall mi they can cause the rupture of the papillary muscles resulting in prolapse of the mitral valve causing mitral regurgitation and next is the cardiomyopathies right which cardiomyopathy is dilated cardiomyopathy restrictive cardiomyopathy hypertrophic cardiomyopathy there will be dilatation of the mitral valve annulus causing mitral regurgitation now out of which you take the mitral valve prolapse when do we use this terminology called mitral valve prolapse what is the criteria the criteria for mitral valve prolapse is very importantly asked in your exam what is the criteria is if the valve is prolapsing into the left atrium by almost 2 mm right the valve is prolapsing into the left atrium by almost 2 mm from the mitral valve annulus during the systole that is what is called mitral valve prolapse and the mitral valve prolapse what is the most common cause for mitral valve prolapse right please remember the answer should be idiopathic the most common cause for mitral valve prolapse and what are the other causes for mitral valve prolapse the other causes for mitral valve prolapse will be the marfan syndrome then the other connective tissue disorders like ehlers danlos syndrome okay these are the connective tissue disorders that will be causing mitral valve prolapse and overall in patients with mitral regurgitation like what will be the clinical manifestation in patients with mitral regurgitation please remember that they go into a state of left ventricular failure but before going into a state of left ventricular failure there will be left ventricular dilatation in patients with mitral regurgitation and this dilated left ventricle will be generating the ectopics and that will be resulting in the palpitations so palpitations is one of the very important clinical feature with mr and followed by that once there is development of left ventricular failure then they develop dyspnea and very important auscultatory finding in patients with mr is that the s1 will be soft or the s1 will be absent in patients with mitral regurgitation followed by that they have the pan systolic murmur and this pan systolic murmur it is heard at the apex and once they enter into a state of left ventricular failure then you will listen third heart sound and even the fourth heart sound in patients with the mitral regurgitation and so not only left ventricular failure they also progress to a state of right ventricular failure once they progress to a state of right ventricular failure you also have the signs of right ventricular failure what will be that that will be the features of raised jvp then there will be also 
the tender hepatomegaly and there will be also presence of the pedal edema so these are the signs that you come across right these are the signs that you come across in patients with the mitral regurgitation but whereas you take in patients with mitral valve prolapse what are the important auscultatory finding important auscultatory finding that you have in mitral valve prolapse is you have the presence of the mid systolic click with late systolic murmur that is what you will listen in uh, mitral valve prolapse and in mitral valve prolapse dynamic auscultation is very very important this is very frequently asked in your exams that is like patients with when patient is doing an isometric hand grip or squatting there will be increase in the venous return so any maneuver which is increasing the venous return in patients with mitral valve prolapse please remember the click will be delayed right the click will be delayed and the murmur will be short whereas you take exactly the opposite that is maneuvers which will decrease the venous return what are the maneuvers which will decrease the venous return like supine position and valsalva so here the click will be early right and murmur will be prolonged okay so the management in patients with mitral regurgitation will be like diuretics along with diuretics the beta blockers should be given right but you require to do mitral valve replacement that is what is the indication for surgical treatment indication for surgical treatment is when left ventricular ejection fraction if it is reduced to less than 55% in patients with mitral regurgitation that is the point when you need to do the mitral valve replacement okay so that is about your mitral regurgitation right then coming to the next important valvular heart disease that is aortic stenosis you need to be very much aware of what is the normal aortic valve area normal aortic valve area is around 3 to 4 cm square and when do you call aortic stenosis we use the word aortic stenosis when the valve area is less than 2 cm square and what is the most common cause for aortic stenosis if you take in children that will be your bicuspid aortic valve whereas in adults the most common cause will be the sclerotic aortic valve so this is basically calcific degeneration of the aortic valve right calcific degeneration of the aortic valve and what are the clinical symptomatology in patients with as please remember this mnemonic that is sad sad stands for syncopal attack angina and as well as dyspnea and on examination in patients with the aortic stenosis you have narrow pulse and how will be the second heart sound the second heart sound usually the a2 will be soft a2 will be soft or it is completely absent right then another point is the murmur the murmur that you will have is ejection systolic murmur that will be radiating to the carotids and another important auscultatory finding in patients with the aortic stenosis is click right so you have a click then followed by that you have the ejection systolic murmur okay and the click is the ejection click so you will have ejection click followed by that the ejection systolic murmur and how do you treat these patients any individual whoever is supposed to be symptomatic aortic stenosis then you need to do the surgical correction surgical correction can be done in two ways in aortic stenosis one is your tower that is transcatheter aortic valve replacement right or the saver that is surgical aortic valve replacement you take this particular tower tower is usually done in patients who are having high surgical mortality in them we do what is called tower that is transcatheter aortic valve replacement but in those individuals who have very minimal surgical mortality in them you can go ahead with surgical aortic valve replacement okay so that is about your aortic stenosis component next we will discuss about the ar aortic regurgitation so can anyone answer this aortic regurgitation does not occur in yes aortic regurgitation does not occur in yes so yeah the aortic regurgitation does not occur in case of the acute myocardial infarction okay in acute myocardial infarction what are the valvular heart diseases that you will be able to observe is mr hmm? in acute mi the valvular heart disease that you can have is mr why mr that is because of the rupture of the papillary muscles 
Whereas in Marfan's rheumatic heart disease and infective endocarditis, you can have this AR, aortic regurgitation. In fact, the most common cause of AR, that will be your rheumatic heart disease is the most common cause of AR. Then followed by that, the infective endocarditis is another cause for AR and even congenital bicuspid aortic valve. And the connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndrome, then osteogenesis imperfecta, then ankylosing spondylitis, then patients with severe hypertension. So in these four conditions, you have the aortic valve dilatation or aortic root dilatation. So because of the aortic root dilatation, because of the aortic root dilatation, you have the presence of the development of the aortic regurgitation. Okay. Now, aortic regurgitation, we have two types, acute and as well as the chronic aortic regurgitation. Patients with acute aortic regurgitation, they present with sudden onset left ventricular failure and you don't have any peripheral signs. But whereas in patients with chronic AR, you have the presence of the peripheral signs. Right. And what are those peripheral signs? That includes number one, Corrigan sign. Corrigan sign is nothing but your the white pulse pressure. Sorry, Corrigan's pulse. Corrigan's pulse is what, what is nothing but the water hammer pulse, right? Where you have the sudden collapsing pulse. Next is Demoset sign. What is Demoset sign? It is head nodding with each cardiac cycle, right? Then is Muller sign. Muller sign is that where you have the pulsations in the uvula with each cardiac cycle is what is called Muller sign. Next is Quinky sign. What is Quinky's? It is that the pulsations that you observe within the nails with each cardiac cycle is what is called Quinky sign. Trop sign. What is trop sign? It is the pistol shot sounds that are being heard over the femoral artery in patients with AR is what is called trop sign. Next is Durosi's murmur or Durosi's sign. What is Durosi's sign? It is the systolic murmur and as well as diastolic murmur that is being heard in over the femoral artery in patients with AR is what is called the Durosi's sign. Next is Hill sign. What is Hill sign? Hill sign is that where the systolic blood pressure in femoral artery is much more than that of the systolic blood pressure in the brachial artery by more than 20 millimeters of mercury is what is called as the Hill sign. All right. Now, in a normal individual, the difference will be less than 20 millimeters of mercury, whereas in AR, it will be more than 20 millimeters of mercury. All right. And what you need to remember is all these peripheral signs are observed only in patients with chronic AR, but not in case of the acute AR is what you need to remember. And how will you diagnose AR? The first line investigation is always the 2D echo or two-dimensional echocardiography. All right. Then coming to the treatment. In patients with AR, what are the drugs that you need to give is, you need to give the drugs which will reduce the afterload on the heart. What are the drugs which will reduce the afterload on the heart? That includes the ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin receptor blockers. And the other drugs that can be given is the aldosterone antagonist. And very important is the beta blockers should be avoided. Now, can anyone tell me why beta blockers are avoided in patients with the aortic regurgitation? Anyone? Why beta blockers are avoided in patients with the aortic regurgitation? So the reason why the beta blockers are avoided is these beta blockers, they increase the diastolic time of the heart. So basically what these beta blockers are doing, they're decreasing the heart rate. So thereby what will happen to the diastolic time increases. So as the diastolic time increases, the regurgitation increases because aortic regurgitation is that regurgitation which is happening during the diastole. So when you are keeping the heart for more time in diastole, the regurgitation also increases. And that is the reason why you should not give the beta blockers. Okay. So that is about the story of the AR. Now we will move on to the discussion of the pericardial disorders. Right, we'll move on to the discussion of pericardial disorders. So in the pericardial disorders, okay, <laughs> sometimes you may get this lengthy clinical questions and let me just see who can answer this lengthy clinical question. And always the rule of thumb is like whenever you get a lengthy clinical question, what is that you need to do first? Read the last sentence. The most likely diagnosis and most appropriate treatment for this patient. Okay. So when this particular question given as for this patient, you need to read the entire clinical scenario. So the clinical scenario is like 24 year old man presenting to the emergency department with chest pain. And the duration of the chest pain is almost like two days. And the pain is increasing with inspiration 
right? And the patient is also having fever. Physical examination showed the ECG, 2 mm ST segment elevation is there without reciprocal changes, right? And along with that, there is concomitant PR segment depression. So can anyone answer what exactly is this? What is the most likely diagnosis and most appropriate treatment in this particular patient? Yes. Please select the answer from the options which has been given to you. Yeah, uh, Jaiswal, this will be useful for both. Hmm? This lecture will be useful for both FMG and as well as the NEAT PG and as well as even for INICT also. Yeah, but uh, yes, Anand, acute pericarditis, you have three options. Which answer is which option is correct in that? Which option is correct in this? Right? So the answer is, it is your acute pericarditis and you need to start the NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, not prednisolone. Not prednisolone. The answer is A. And the, the anti-inflammatory drug, why is that you are giving? Because it is inflammation, pericarditis. So you need to give non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We give prednisolone only when the individual is refractory to your NSAIDs. Now, now what is that you need to know is what is the most common cause for the acute pericarditis. The most common cause for acute pericarditis, it is mostly viral in etiology. And among the virus, which virus is most common? That is the Coxsackie virus. So Coxsackie A and as well as Coxsackie B is the most common virus. And followed by that, the ecovirus is very important uh, cause for your acute pericarditis. But the most common is Coxsackie virus. And what will be the clinical presentation in these patients with your uh, acute pericarditis? You need to be very much aware of the triad. What is a triad is you have the chest pain. And the character of the chest pain in patients with acute pericarditis is that the pain increases on the inspiration. Then on auscultation, you will listen the pericardial friction rub. And ECG changes, what is that? You will have the ECG changes. That is global ST segment elevation except AVR. In AVR, you have the ST segment depression. All right. And there will be PR segment depression in all the leads except AVR. So in AVR, what is that you will have is the PR segment elevation is what you will have in case of the AVR. Okay. So this is the diagnostic triad. And this is how the ECG will be. You can observe in all the leads, you have the ST segment elevation. And that too, like what will be the shape of the ST segment elevation in all the leads is concave ST segment elevation. But only in case of AVR, you have the PR segment depression. And you take the, I'm sorry, the ST segment depression. And the other one is the PR segment. PR segment, it is depressed in all the leads. In all the leads, the PR segment is depressed. Only in case of AVR, you will notice that the PR segment is elevated. Okay. So that is about your acute pericarditis ECG. And the treatment is your NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And only when the individual is refractory to medical management, I mean, refractory to the NSAIDs, then you need to give prednisolone. Otherwise, the preferred drug or the first line drug will be the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Right. So that was about your acute pericarditis. Then we will move on to the discussion of the constrictive pericarditis, right? The next topic will be the constrictive pericarditis, right? You see this question, a 45 year old woman complains of increasing shortness of breath on exertion. Along with that, the patient is also having orthopnea for the previous three to four months. And she had apparently recovered from pericarditis about a year earlier. On ECG, what is that you will observe is a low voltage complexes are there right? Particularly in the limb leads. Chest x-ray shows pericardial calcification. The presumptive diagnosis is constrictive pericarditis. Which of the following physical signs would be consistent with this? Yeah. Any one of you, please answer this. Increased jugular distension on inspiration, third heart sound, fourth heart sound, loud first and second heart sound. Yes. So now this is the clinical scenario suggestive of constrictive pericarditis. 
Why is that you are considering it as constrictive pericarditis? Because there is presence of pericardial calcification. And whenever you are considering it as constrictive pericarditis, you need to know in patients with constrictive pericarditis, third and fourth heart sound you don't have. And you don't have loud first and second heart sound. In patients with constrictive pericarditis, in fact, you have muffled heart sounds. You have increased jugular venous distension on inspiration. What is this particular sign? This is what is nothing but your Kusmal sign. So Kusmal sign is very much characteristic in patients with a constrictive pericarditis. And in patients with constrictive pericarditis, as I have said you, you have thickening of the pericardium. Okay, you see this is the pericardium, which is like being thickened. This is a pericardium, which is being thickened. And how much should be the thickening of the pericardium is, the thickening of the pericardium should be more than 4 mm. And the thickening of the pericardium of more than 4 mm, that can be made out either by CT or the MRI. Right. Otherwise, what is the first line diagnosis for diagnosing your constrictive pericarditis is the 2D echo. Right. And what will be the clinical features in these patients? They'll have both the right and as well as left heart failure features. Right heart failure and as well as left heart failure features will be there. And along with that, these patients with constrictive pericarditis, they have increased at risk of thromboembolic events. They have increased at risk of thromboembolic events. All right. And what is the most common cause of the constrictive pericarditis? Most common cause of constrictive pericarditis will be, it is a sequelae of the pyopericardium and as well as, right, and as well as the tuberculosis. These are the causes for the constrictive pericarditis. And in patients with constrictive pericarditis, you have one important characteristic sign whenever you do a cardiac catheterization. What is that characteristic sign that you will have whenever you do cardiac catheterization is the presence of the square root sign. Right? Presence of the square root sign. It is very much characteristic in patients with the constrictive pericarditis. And what is the square root sign? That basically this is your ventricular pressure changes. Right? Basically, this is the ventricular pressure changes that you will observe in patients with the constrictive pericarditis. Right. And what exactly is this particular dip? The dip says you the fall in the ventricular pressure during ventricular relaxation. Then elevation tells you the ventricular filling whenever the ventricular has undergone the diastole, right? And the plateau tells you that the pressure within the ventricle has become constant. Further increase in your ventricular pressure is not there. Why? Because the pericardium is being calcified. It will not take more blood further. That is the reason why you have this particular plateau phase, all right? So the square root sign, it is a cardiac catheterization finding in patients with the constrictive pericarditis and that is a ventricular pressure changes. And you take this characteristic apex in patients with constrictive pericarditis, you have what is called the broadband sign. And what exactly is the broadband sign? That is the apical impulse is reduced and retracts in systole. That is what is called the broadband sign. And in patients with constrictive pericarditis, you also listen an additional sound. What is the additional sound that you listen in patients with constrictive pericarditis is pericardial knock. Right. So pericardial knock is a characteristic it's a it's a diastolic sound. Right. So this is a right, this is a diastolic sound. Okay. And this pericardial knock, at the same time, you need to be very much aware that it's a low pitched sound. And occasionally, even it can be high pitch as well. But when you, when both the options are given, whether it is a high pitched sound or a low pitched sound, then you need to go with the high pitched sound. Okay. Right. And this pericardial knock, it is heard only in patients with the constrictive pericarditis during the diastole. And how will you diagnose this constrictive pericarditis is one is your by ECG. What does the ECG show in patients with constrictive pericarditis? You have what is called low voltage complexes. Now, what is the criteria to call it as the low voltage complexes is you take the QRS complexes in the chest leads, it will be less than 10 mm. And QRS complexes in the limb leads, that will be less than 5 mm in patients with the constrictive pericarditis. And next important finding is the chest x-ray. What is this chest x-ray finding in patients with constrictive pericarditis is you will be able to observe the pericardial calcification. Right, you will be able to observe the pericardial calcification. But this pericardial calcification is significantly observed in the later view of the chest X-ray in patients with the constrictive pericarditis. And another important first-line investigation in patients with constrictive pericarditis is what? 
that is your 2d echo and what does the 2d echo will show you 2d echo will demonstrate this particular septal bounds hmm? 2d echo will demonstrate the septal bounds and what exactly is this particular septal bounds that is the interventricular septum will be shifted towards the left ventricle during inspiration right and the interventricular septum will be shifted towards the right ventricle during expiration and this is what is called as the septal bounds and how can you measure the thickness of your pericardium the measurement of the thickness of the pericardium is being done by your ct or mri ct or mri will show you the thickness of the pericardium is like more than 4 mm okay so this particular thickness will be around 4 mm then how do you treat these patients with uh, constrictive pericarditis? Because these patients are having the features of right and left ventricular failure. There is like pedal edema and pulmonary edema. So you need to give diuretics along with that salt restriction should be done. And in medical management refractory cases, the treatment that you need to do is pericardiectomy is what you need to do. Right? You need to do pericardiectomy in uh, medically refractory cases. All right. So that was about your pericardial disorders, that is acute pericarditis and as well as the constrictive pericarditis. Now, let me take up the next important topic, that is the hypertension. So in the hypertension, yes, please go through this question. A 44-year-old woman presents with episodes of headache associated with the anxiety, sweating and the rapid pulse rate. At the time of her initial consultation, her blood pressure was... 150 by 95 millimeters of mercury in a seated position, right? But 24 hour ambulatory monitoring shown a peak of 215 by 130 millimeters of mercury associated with symptoms described above. Which of the following would be your initial diagnostic procedure? What all the patient is having? That is headache, anxiety, and as well as sweating and rapid pulse rate. So, can anyone tell me? What is the suspicious diagnosis? Hmm? What is the diagnosis that you can suspect in these patients? Very good. So it is your very good Anand. So this is very much suggestive of the pheochromocytoma. Why is that like you are suspecting pheochromocytoma? Is that you have the triad in pheochromocytoma. That is your anxiety <coughs> and as well as sweating. Why is this anxiety and sweating? That is because of increase in basal metabolic rate whenever there is increase in your catecholamines in patients with the pheochromocytoma. And why is this headache? That is because of the hypertension. And why is this rapid pulse rate? Because of increased chronotropicity by your catecholamines. And that is what gives rise to rapid pulse rate. And if you take the blood pressure, there is like episodic hypertension. Why is this episodic hypertension? That is because of pulse style release of your catecholamines. So for diagnosing your pheochromocytoma, what is very important first line investigation is like the 24 hour urinary metanephrines over 24 hour period. All right. So the answer is C here. Then if you take that, uh, what is the confirmatory test for your pheochromocytoma? Anyone? What is a confirmatory test for pheochromocytoma? So confirmatory test for pheochromocytoma will be assessment of the plasma metanephrine levels. Right? Assessment of the plasma metanephrine levels is what is your confirmatory test in patients with your pheochromocytoma. All right? Next, you take this uh, hypertension. We have two forms. One is your primary hypertension and the other one is secondary hypertension. And this primary hypertension is what is nothing but your essential hypertension. Right. And this is the most common cause of the hypertension. All right. And secondary hypertension is observed only in 15 percentage of cases. And primary hypertension is observed in almost 85 percentage of cases. All right. And in secondary hypertension, what is the most common cause? The most common cause will be renal parenchymal disease. So renal parenchymal disease, that will be the most common cause for the secondary hypertension. All right. So, yeah, the same question again. Most common cause of the secondary hypertension is what? The most common cause for secondary hypertension will be the renal parenchymal disease. And the remaining all, they are the causes for secondary hypertension. Okay. But among all these, the most common cause will be renal parenchymal disease. But in certain clinical scenarios, you have what is called as the isolated systolic hypertension. 
hmm, you have what is called isolated systolic hypertension now what are the conditions where you have isolated systolic hypertension is these are the conditions where you have the isolated systolic hypertension that is atherosclerosis aortic regurgitation pda thyrotoxicosis and as well as the coagulation of aorta these are the causes of the isolated systolic hypertension and you need to be very much aware of the conditions where you have unequal blood pressure between the right and as well as the left upper limb okay so unequal blood pressure between the right and as well as left upper limb one of the very very important cause is the takayasu arthritis okay so in case of the takayasu arthritis you have the unequal blood pressure between both right and as well as upper limbs and you also have that in patients with the coagulation of aorta and but they, where should be this coagulation the coagulation should not be distal to your left subclavian artery that should be your proximal to the left subclavian artery that is only the when you have difference in the blood pressure between the right and as well as left upper limb and even in patients with the aortic dissection you have the unequal blood pressure between the right and as well as the left upper limb okay and even in patients with supravalvular aortic stenosis so even in patients with supravalvular aortic stenosis you have difference in the uh, blood pressure between the right and as well as the upper limbs all right and if you take the uh, guidelines that we are that we are following for the treatment of hypertension now is the aha guidelines that is american heart association guidelines which has been given in 2017 so according to these guidelines what it says is in elderly individuals or you take in adults adults the systolic blood pressure should be less than 130 hmm? systolic blood pressure should be less than 130 by 80 okay systolic should be less than 130 and diastolic blood pressure should be less than 80 if at all if the systolic blood pressure is more than 130 then the individual is considered to be having hypertension where you need to start the anti hypertensives that is according to your american heart association guidelines but you take jnc 8 jnc 8 the cutoff is slightly on the higher side that is 140 right that is 140 right but what is given in your textbooks mainly if you take the recent edition of the harrison that is the american heart association so according to american heart association it is your 130 is the cut off and if it is more than 130 you need to consider it as hypertension and where you need to start the anti hypertensive drugs and in the treatment of the hypertension what is very important is the lifestyle modification so in the lifestyle modification very important in the lifestyle modification is weight reduction and you need to maintain the bmi of 18.5 to 24.9 that is the ideal weight that the individual with hypertension should maintain by maintaining this particular bmi how much will be the blood pressure that can be reduced 5 to 20 mm of mercury for every 10 kg weight loss right 5 to 20 mm of mercury for every 10 kg weight loss the uh, advantage is okay and the diet that should be adopted is dash diet what is this particular dash diet dash diet is that particular diet which is rich in fruits and as well as the vegetables and next is the dietary sodium restriction and how much should be the sodium that re, that should be restricted is 6 g sodium chloride per day should be given and physical activity is very very important that is 30 minutes of brisk exercise is very important in the case of patients with hypertension that will reduce the blood pressure by 4 to 9 and the if the individual is alcoholic right if the individual is alcoholic right it is two drinks okay two drinks in males and it should be like one drink in females that is that can be advised and with that the blood pressure that can be reduced is almost 2 to 4 mm of mercury okay right yes uh, helping healing hands this is for the fmg itself okay now coming to the treatment for hypertension what is the first line anti hypertensive what you need to give is the first line anti hypertensive whatever might be the age right i mean particularly whatever might be the ethnicity whatever might be the ethnicity the first line anti hypertensive should be calcium channel blocker or the diuretic right first line anti hypertensive should be calcium channel blocker or diuretic right second line will be your ace inhibitor or arbs hmm? second line will be your ace inhibitor or arbs particularly in black population okay whereas if you take whites the ace inhibitors or arbs itself is the first line but if the question is asked what will be the first line anti hypertensive then the answer should be your diuretic and what should what type of diuretic is that 
that is your thiazide group of diuretic right and what is that particular thiazide group of diuretic that is your hydrochlorothiazide all right or the calcium channel blocker and which type of calcium channel blocker it should be dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker that is amlodipine or cilindipine should be given and we have one more clinical entity called resistant hypertension right can anyone tell me when do you call this resistant hypertension right when do you call this resistant hypertension yes anyone right so resistant hypertension is that where the individual should be right where the individual should be taking three drugs right three antihypertensives that should be of different class but they should be given like full dose among these three antihypertensive one should be diuretic right one should be diuretic Okay, now what will be the answer? The answer is not A. The answer will be B. Right? So it should be two drugs of different classes plus diuretics. Two drugs of different classes plus diuretics. Okay, with maximum dose. That is what is called as the resistant hypertension. And what is the most common cause of resistant hypertension? Most common cause of resistant hypertension will be non compliance most common cause of resistant hypertension will be non-compliance okay so that was about the topic of the hypertension then next important thing in the cardiology that we will be discussing is about the infective endocarditis so you take this infective endocarditis what exactly is the point in infective endocarditis is the formation of the vegetations so if you take the vegetations in patients with infective endocarditis they are a highly friable vegetations they are highly friable vegetations. These highly friable vegetations, they have increased at risk of the embolism. They have increased at risk of embolism. And these vegetations, they are non-sterile vegetations. And what is another what are the other conditions where you have the formation of the vegetations apart from your the infective endocarditis? Infective endocarditis, non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, rheumatic fever, and then SLE. These are the all these are the four conditions where you have the formation of the vegetations. But out of all these, the highly friable vegetations are observed in case of infective endocarditis. All right. Whereas you take in case of the Lipman Sachs endocarditis, SLE. SLE endocarditis is nothing but the Lipman Sachs endocarditis. Okay. And you take non-bacterial. Here the most friable the answer is A, that is infective endocarditis. What is your non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis? Non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis is the endocarditis which is observed in hypercoagulable states. Okay. In hypercoagulable in, uh, individuals, the formation of the vegetations can be seen over the valve. But in these conditions, that is non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, rheumatic fever, and as well as SLE, the vegetations that you will observe will be completely sterile vegetations. Mm, completely sterile vegetations and you need to be very much aware of what are the organisms causing uh, infective endocarditis. See, we classify the endocarditis into acute, subacute and as well as infective endocarditis in IV drug abusers. So acute uh, infective endocarditis, what is the most common organism? The most common organism will be Staphylococcus aureus, which is a highly virulent organism. Whereas subacute infective endocarditis, that is low virulent organism. And what is a low virulent organism? That is the streptococcus. And the organ, in case of subacute infective endocarditis, it is the previously injured valve or previously damaged valves are the one that you see in case of subacute infective endocarditis. Whereas infective endocarditis in IV drug abusers, that is mainly right-sided valves are commonly affected. That is tricuspid valve is very, very commonly affected. And organisms are the Staphylococcus aureus and as well as the fungal infections that is Candida. Fungal infections that is Candida are very, very commonly affected. Then we have one more form of infective endocarditis that is called prosthetic valve endocarditis. Prosthetic valve endocarditis is that if the, uh, if the prosthetic valves are affected within like uh, 60 days, that is what is called as the early prosthetic valve endocarditis. And if the prosthetic valves are affected by the infectious organism after 60 days, then we call it as late prosthetic valve endocarditis. And you need to know what are the organisms. 
right so you take the um uh, organisms less than 2 months or even 2 to 12 months the organism is the most common organism is the coagulase negative staphylococci that is staphylococcus epidermidis whereas after 12 months then the organism will be your strep viridens right and as well as your staphylococcus aureus right so these are the organisms that will be causing prosthetic valve endocarditis and you need to be very much aware of a very very important syndrome that is called austrian syndrome in cases of infective endocarditis and this austrian syndrome is that which is caused by streptococcus pneumonia right and these patients with the austrian syndrome they have what is called a triad and three important organs are affected what are those one is your lungs in the form of the pneumonia next brain in the form of meningitis heart in the form of the infective endocarditis all right so this is about your austrian syndrome or the ostler triad see we have one more uh, terminology called ostler's nodes ostler's nodes are different it is also present in infective endocarditis which are present over the pulp of the fingers that will be the examination finding in patients with the infective endocarditis all right then next you need to be very much aware that the infective endocarditis is very common in individuals who are having the pre existing cardiac lesions right in individuals having pre existing cardiac lesion there is high chance of infective endocarditis and among the options which has been given to you which of the following cardiac lesion is the highest risk of development of infective endocarditis asd mvp without mr valvular aortic regurgitation ms so always remember wherever there is a high pressure gradient there is high risk of development of infective endocarditis and among the options which has been given to you the high pressure gradient will be present across the ar so ar as mr tetralogy of fallow vsd patent ductus arteriosus then yeah so these are and even prosthetic valves these are the high risk lesions for for the development of infective endocarditis these are the high risk lesions for the development of infective endocarditis because these are the areas where you have there is a high pressure gradient and one more that is coagulation of aorta right one more coagulation of aorta then some important images are there in infective endocarditis right in the infective endocarditis the emboli will enter into the digital circulation causing what is called as the splinter hemorrhages and within the palm and within the foot you see what is called as the ostler's nodes the ostler's nodes you observe within the pulp of the fingers and these ostler's nodes they are very much painful <clears throat> and next important is the janeway lesions janeway lesions they are present over the palm and sole and they are non tender right they are non tender which one janeway lesions where are ostler's nodes they are very much painful right and in patients with the infective endocarditis you also have the presence of the digital infarcts right digital infarcts why do you get this digital infarcts the emboli will enter into the digital blood vessels and thereby the digits they get infarcted and one more important is the rot spots what are these rot spots in patients with infective endocarditis they are nothing but retinal hemorrhages they are nothing but retinal hemorrhages all right and these rot spots the other conditions where you come across is in patients with diabetes mellitus hypertension anemia leukocytosis polyarteritis nodosa and in patients with sle these are all the other conditions where you have the presence of the rot spots and what is the name of the criteria for infective endocarditis the name of the criteria is the dukes criteria right and you also should be very much aware of what is called as the duke staging the duke staging is what used for the carcinoma of the rectum and uh, right and the next one is the duke scoring the duke scoring is used for the chronic stable angina and in the duke's criteria what are major and what are minor criteria so if you take the major criteria in case of the infective endocarditis one is your blood culture right one is your blood culture okay so the blood culture more than or equal to two blood cultures that should be positive 
and second important major criteria is the presence of the vegetations and the vegetations can be made out by your 2d eco that is two dimensional echocardiography and next important is like minor criteria so minor criteria what all should be there is there should be presence of a pre existing cardiac lesion fever more than 38 degrees centigrade and vascular phenomena which is nothing but your presence of janeway lesions and immunological phenomena that is your oscillars nodes and rod spots and microbiological evidence that is in the form of the blood culture which is being positive but not meeting the major criteria then what is the diagnostic criteria according to your dukes the diagnostic criteria is either there should be like two major right or one major plus three minor right or the presence of all the five minor criteria the presence of all the five minor criteria that will be the diagnostic criteria for infective endocarditis and how do you treat these patients with infective endocarditis initially you need to start with the empirical antibiotics the empirical antibiotic will be covering the most common organisms what are those most common organisms that is staph strep and as well as enterococci and the empirical antibiotics that you need to start is the vancomycin and as well as the ceftriaxone and the next important treatment will completely depend upon like what exactly is the culture and as well as the sensitivity all right then very important is about the fungal endocarditis so if you take fungal endocarditis in the fungal endocarditis the most common organism is the candida these patients with candida causing fungal endocarditis they require initially medical management that is liposomal amphotericin b along with that you need to give flu cytosine right along with that flu cytosine should be given okay and the remaining that this should be given for nearly around 2 weeks and remaining they will be requiring fluconazole throughout the life and these patients with fungal endocarditis always they require this surgical treatment right they require surgical treatment and the prognosis in patients with the fungal endocarditis it's a poor prognosis the question asked is except so the prognosis is not good the right the prognosis is a poor prognosis in these patients all right that was about your infective endocarditis then next we will take up the topic of the rheumatic fever okay so this will be the last topic in the cardiology right the remaining all topics i have discussed in part 2 so most of the manifestations of acute rheumatic fever presents approximately 3 weeks after precipitating group a streptococcal infection which manifestation may present several months after the precipitating infection chorea erythema marginatum fever polyarthritis then subcutaneous nodules which manifestation may present several months after the precipitating infection yes that means which is the last manifestation in patients with the rheumatic fever very good anand so that will be your chorea that is sydenham's chorea so sydenham's chorea right it is the last manifestation that you will have in patients with the rheumatic fever and in rheumatic fever usually you don't have deformities but the deformities in patients with rheumatic fever you see that very occasionally and the name of the deformity is the jacquard's arthropathy and what is this jacquard's arthropathy that is the alar deviation of the hand that is called jacquard's arthropathy right now please tell me what is the earliest valvular lesion that you have in acute rheumatic fever what is the earliest valvular lesion you will have in acute rheumatic fever so two points here in acute rheumatic fever the earliest valvular lesion is mr whereas in chronic rheumatic heart disease right in chronic rheumatic heart disease the most common valvular lesion will be ms that is mitral stenosis that is mitral stenosis all right and you need to know the treatment the drug of choice for arthritis in patients with the rheumatic heart disease is you need to give high dose aspirin hmm? you need to give high dose aspirin all right and only when the individual is refractory to your aspirin that is the point when you need to give steroids hmm? that is the point when you need to give steroids okay and prophylaxis is very important in case of rheumatic fever which has to be given every 21 days and the prophylaxis is given with the antibiotic that is benzathine penicillin deep intramuscular 1.2 million units should be given 1.2 million units should be given 
okay that is about your the rheumatic fever so this completes the discussion of the topics related to your cardiology right and lastly i'll do a quick uh, discussion of the hepatology which is important right so if you take the revision related to the gat in which all right so yes please see this question a 73 year old man with history of the alcoholism and hepatitis c presents with lethargy and hypersomnia he has been sleeping all the day and not taking any of his medication on examination the patient has ascites palmar edema edema spider keel injectasia and he also has the flapping tremors of his hands when dorsiflexed laboratory test revealed in normal ammonia levels right what is the most likely diagnosis in this patient and what is the best initial therapy what is the best therapy to reduce the recurrence or improve the quality of life what is the diagnosis in this case so the diagnosis in this case is your hepatic encephalopathy right it is your hepatic encephalopathy so surprisingly like the ammonia levels are normal in these individuals but that can be because there are many other toxic substances which can cause the hepatic encephalopathy apart from ammonia right so the diagnosis is hepatic encephalopathy what are the precipitating factors here alcoholism and as well as the hepatitis c now you need to know the toxic substances in patients with the hepatic encephalopathy the most common will be definitely ammonia and what are the other toxic substances the other toxic substances will be gamma amino butyric acid then mercaptans right then phenol next octopamine okay these are the toxic substances which can be increased in patients with the hepatic encephalopathy and what is the earliest clinical manifestation that you will have in patients with the uh, hepatic encephalopathy please remember the earliest clinical manifestation is your reversal of sleep rhythm right reversal of sleep rhythm what do you mean by the word reversal of sleep rhythm that is throughout the day the patient will be sleeping and throughout the night the sleep is lost there is reduced sleep during that night and increased sleep during the day that is what is called reversal of the sleep rhythm and what is the earliest examination finding earliest examination finding is what is called as the constructional apraxia right constructional apraxia so what is this constructional apraxia is you just draw a simple image and you ask the individual to draw the same image he will not be able to do that that is called constructional apraxia that will be the earliest examination finding and followed by that you have the presence of the flapping tremors right followed by that you have the presence of the flapping tremors and next is what is the most relevant investigation so what do you think is the most relevant investigation uh, in patients with the hepatic encephalopathy is your ammonia levels right if suppose if the serum ammonia levels are normal but still you are suspecting hepatic encephalopathy then you need to do the eeg hmm? then you need to do eeg that is electroencephalograph okay that is another important reliable investigation all right then what is the best initial therapy the best initial therapy that you need to give is the lactulose right lactulose what it will do it will bind the ammonia and it will cause the excretion of the ammonia hmm? it will cause the excretion of the ammonia and if the individual is refractory to the medical management then what is the 
right if the individual is refractory to the medical management then what is the alternative therapies that you can do is you need to do what is called liver dialysis and what do you understand by this liver dialysis liver dialysis like we do what is called mars mirs what is this mirs molecular absorbent reabsorbent system right molecular absorbent reabsorbent system that is what is the treatment for your the hepatic encephalopathy if the individual is refractory to medical management okay and for the development of a, a hepatic encephalopathy there are certain precipitating factors now tell me which of the following is not the precipitating factor for hepatic encephalopathy in patients with chronic liver disease any one of you <clears throat> yes which is which of the following is not the precipitating factor so hypokalemia will precipitate hepatic encephalopathy hyponatremia hypoxia can precipitate but it is not metabolic acidosis it is your metabolic alkalosis which will precipitate the hepatic encephalopathy and the most relevant investigation what did i discuss the most relevant investigation is the eeg what does the eeg show the eeg will show you the triphasic wave pattern the eeg will show you the triphasic wave pattern all right and this particular triphasic wave pattern is very common in which stage of the hepatic encephalopathy that is stage 4 stage 1 stage 5 or stage 2 of hepatic encephalopathy is the question that will be asked any one of you triphasic wave forms in hepatic encephalopathy will occur in case of stage 4 hmm? that is in stage of coma you have this triphasic wave pattern all right and this particular triphasic wave pattern if you see like how is it being described as it is being described as symmetrical high voltage triphasic slow wave pattern so where do you get this symmetrical high voltage triphasic slow wave pattern that is what you will observe in case of the hepatic encephalopathy all right so that was about your story of hepatic encephalopathy now let me discuss one more important complication of your the cirrhosis of liver or ascites whatever it is you just see this question 47 year old man with chronic alcoholism presents with abdominal pain and fever he had multiple admissions for variceal bleed and ascites required requiring large volume paracentesis all right the pain is diffuse and has been getting worse since day he also has fever chills and rigors on examination he has diffuse tenderness over the abdomen with shifting dullness and fluid wave what do you think is the most organism here okay first of all can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis here yes what is the diagnosis so diagnosis that you need to answer here is sbp that is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and in case of the spontaneous bacterial peritonitis what is the most common organism usually the most common organism is gram negative infection A gram negative bacteria what is that gram negative bacteria that is the escherichia coli is the most common organism that will be causing spontaneous bacterial peritonitis now let me tell you few points related to your sbp so the most common organism that will be causing spontaneous bacterial peritonitis will be escherichia coli the other organisms will be your klebsiella pneumonia and what will be the clinical features in patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis that is severe abdominal pain and what is the accurate diagnostic test the accurate diagnostic test is you need to do the examination of the ascitic fluid so when you do examination of the ascitic fluid what is there in the ascitic fluid you have the presence of the wbcs and mainly polymorphonuclear leukocytes and how much should be that increase in polymorphonuclear leukocytes that should be more than 250 cells per microliter and how do you treat these patients with the help of iv antibiotic the antibiotic of choice in these individual is ceftriaxone or you can also give cefotaxim ceftriaxon or cefotaxim should be given but in those individuals with liver failure the antibiotic of choice will be meropenem the antibiotic of choice in case of liver failure will be meropenem or 
you need to give daptomycin hmm? you need to give daptomycin okay so that is the antibiotic that you need to give whenever the individual is having liver cell failure in case of sbp and in patients with cirrhosis of liver or liver cell failure very important is very importantly asked with questions many times is the assessment of the cbrt of liver cell failure what is the scoring system uh, we have for the assessment of the liver cbrt is liver cell uh, failure cbrt is meld score df score and child pug score out of which you take the meld score what has been asked very frequently um, with this particular scores is the parameters which will be there in the scoring system what is that first is meld score what is meld score model for end stage renal sorry model for end stage liver disease there are three parameters in this what are these three parameters that includes bilirubin creatinine and as well as the inr and very important confusing option that you will be given in your four options is albumin right and most of the students will go with al uh, most of the students will go with the answer as what will be the question asked they'll give you these four options right and they will ask you the question which among the following is not the parameter of model for end stage liver disease right albumin it is synthesized in the liver so most of you think that the creatinine is not the part of the liver so you just mark the creatinine but please remember in meld albumin is not the parameter which is taken bilirubin creatinine and inr is what is being taken right and what is the importance of your meld more is your meld score more is the chances of your mortality like for example if the meld score is like 40 then the chances of mortality is almost 71% and one more important point related to your meld is that if the meld score is like more than 14 then they are the candidates for liver transplantation they are the candidates for liver transplantation all right and one more important scoring system is df score that is discriminant function score this discriminant function score it is mainly used for the treatment in case of the alcoholic hepatitis and in what way this is important is like if suppose if the discriminant function is like uh, score is more than or equal to 32 then you need to give steroids right you need to give steroids or the other drug what you need to give is the pentoxifilin can be given okay so you are uh, coming to your child pug score so meld score it is for cirrhosis of liver right whereas child pug score right child pug score this is also for cirrhosis of liver but discriminant function score that is for the treatment of the alcoholic hepatitis okay now in the child pug score what are the parameters that are there in the child pug score the parameters that you have in the child pug score are these that is bilirubin albumin ascites astrexis and inr and if suppose if the child pug score is like more than or equal to 7 then they are the candidates who require the liver cell transplantation okay or liver transplantation that is the importance of child pug score so in child pug score also what is that they will ask is they will ask you about the parameters they will ask you about the parameters all right that is about your child pug classification okay next now one last question then we will wind up this particular session a 49 year old alcoholic man presents with hematemesis that began 2 hours ago he was intubated for the airway protection his past medical history is significant for hepatitis c and that has not been treated he consumes one bottle of whiskey a day he is tachypneic to 140 with a blood pressure of 99 by 68 mm of mercury right and oral cavity showed the presence of blood and palmar erythema is present till angiectasia are vis vis visible over the thorax ast to alt ratio is around 100 to 56 prothrombin time is 24 seconds and hemoglobin is almost 6 grams per deciliter okay what is the next best step in the management of this particular patient iv fluids and blood products or triotide endoscopic band ligation and tips first of all can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis of this patient hmm, what is the diagnosis of this particular patient and what is the next best step that you will be doing in this case so diagnosis is first the individual is having hematemesis and what is the past history hepatitis c infection 
and you are having all the features suggestive of liver cell failure. Hmm? That is palmar erythema, tele injectasia, prothrombin levels elevated. So what is the diagnosis first of all? So the diagnosis in this case is, is a patient with liver cell failure. Along with that, there is portal hypertension, right? And this portal hypertension is causing esophageal varices. And these esophageal varices have been ruptured. And the ruptured esophageal varices is the one which is responsible for the development of hematemesis. And the blood pressure of the individual is like 99 by 68. So what do you think is the next best step? Hmm? So please don't jump onto the drugs here. Hmm? The next best step is IV fluids and as well as blood products. So what is very important in the treatment of your um, portal hypertension causing rupture of the esophageal varices is first stabilize the patient. After stabilizing the patient, then you can give the drugs. And what is the drug of choice? The drug of choice will be terlipresin. In bleeding esophageal varices, right? Followed by that, the alternative drug will be octreotide. Okay. And once the patient is like stabilized, then you can plan for your endoscopic band ligation in patients with the es uh, bleeding esophageal varices. And uh, if suppose if there is recurrence, right? The bleeding esophageal varices, there is recurrence. Then you need to do what is called TIPS, that is transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. Transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. Okay. And how much is the normal portal uh, pressure? The normal portal pressure is around 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. And when do you call it as portal hypertension? When the portal pressure is more than 10 millimeters of mercury, we call it as portal hypertension. And what is the drug of choice for non-bleeding esophageal varices? Any one of you? Hmm? For non-bleeding esophageal varices, the drug of choice will be uh, uh, propranolol, that is non-selective beta blocker. And what is the advantage of this propranolol? Propranolol will reduce the portal pressure. Hmm? Propranolol will reduce the portal pressure. All right. So this is about your the portal hypertension causing esophageal varices. And uh, okay, and I'll show you a few more questions. And what exactly is the tips? That uh, image is very important. This is your tips: transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. So basically, what we do in the tips is we bypass the liver, and by bypassing the liver, we connect the portal vein directly to the hepatic vein. So in between, what is that we are bypassing? We are bypassing the portal sinusoids. That is what is called tips. So what is that you are doing? You are transmitting the pressure of the portal vein to the hepatic veins directly. Thereby, you will reduce the portal venous pressure. Okay. And you see this question very important and asked very frequently. What should be the abdominal pressure in case of the abdominal compartment syndrome? To call it as abdominal compartment syndrome. Right. What should be the pressure within the abdomen or what should be the intra-abdominal pressure? Hmm? So the intra-abdominal pressure, if it is like 25 millimeters of mercury, then we call it as abdominal compartment syndrome. And the abdominal compartment syndrome, if it has developed secondary to accumulation of the fluid in the peritoneal cavity, then it is called tensositis. Hmm? Then it is called tensositis. And for the development of tensositis, how much uh, ml of the fluid should be accumulated in the peritoneal cavity is more than 2 liters of the fluid should be accumulated in the peritoneal cavity. And in patients with the tensositis, you don't have, okay, I'll be showing you the different maneuvers that you will be doing based on the quantity of the fluid accumulated. First important is puddle sign, right? When will you get this puddle sign being positive is, the puddle sign will be positive when the quantity of the fluid which is accumulated in the peritoneal cavity is around 120 ml, right? The next is the shifting dullness, okay? So when will you have the shifting dullness to be positive. You will have the shifting dullness to be positive when the quantity of the fluid which is accumulated in the peritoneal cavity is around 500 ml, right? Then next is the fluid thrill. When will you have the fluid thrill to be positive is when the quantity of the fluid is around 
1 to 1.5 liters then the fluid thrill will be positive right and you have to remember or you have to understand that in patients with tense ascites the quantity of the fluid which is accumulated is more than 2 liters and in these patients the fluid thrill is absent in these patients the fluid thrill will be absent and what is the treatment of choice in patients with the tense ascites is you need to do emergency abdominal paracentesis has to be done otherwise the individual will go into a state of right otherwise the individual will go into a state of the abdominal compartment syndrome where there will be gangrene of the visceral organs where there will be gangrene of visceral organs and one more important complication of your cirrhosis of liver is hepatorenal syndrome right please answer this which of the following drugs should be avoided in patients with the hepatorenal syndrome which of the following drugs should be uh, avoided in patients with hepatorenal syndrome? Okay, so whenever there is hepatorenal syndrome, please remember these patients will land up in what is called as pre-renal type of acute renal failure. Hmm? They will land up in what is called pre-renal type of acute renal failure. So whenever they develop pre-renal type of acute renal failure, the drugs that should be avoided in patients with hepatorenal syndrome is the diuretics. But the drugs which can be given for the treatment of your hepatorenal syndrome is terlipressin. Terlipressin, in fact, it is considered as the drug of choice. The alternative will be your octreotide and as well as the norepinephrine. Okay, so that is about your the hepatorenal syndrome, which is one of the complications that you come across in patients with the uh, cirrhosis of liver. And one more important complication that you come across in patients with cirrhosis of liver is the hepatopulmonary syndrome. Right. So if you take this. Yeah, you see this question. Why there is platypnea in patients with the hepatopulmonary syndrome? What do you mean by the word platypnea in patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome? That is when the individual is in sitting position, they'll have dyspnea, right? So sitting position, they will have dyspnea. But whenever the individual lies down, okay, in supine position, the dyspnea disappears. Mm, that is what is called platypnea. So why there is platypnea in hepatopulmonary syndrome? The reason for platypnea in patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome among the options which has been given to you is due to vascular dilatations at the base of the lung. Mm, vascular dilatations at the base of the lung is what is the one uh, is what is that which will uh, result in the development of platypnea. And in patients with your hepatopulmonary syndrome, you have what is called Ortho, yeah, same thing. Platypnea orthodeoxia syndrome is nothing but where the individual will have dyspnea in like uh, in sitting position, but in supine position, the dyspnea disappears. Okay. That is what is your hepatopulmonary syndrome, right? And this completes the discussion of the some of the important topics related to your hepatology. Okay. So with this, I'll just wind up this particular session because you're, uh, you take gastroenterology part as such that is mainly covered in your surgery. What is important in your the hepatology part is mainly the cirrhosis of liver and as well as its complication. So that is what I have covered here. So with this, we are done with almost all the topics related to the general medicine, right? And the remaining topics, if you take like hematology, which will be covered in your pathology part, so which I'm not doing here, Otherwise, you take in Remarkable Rapid Revision Part 1, Part 2. I have covered the remaining parts of the general medicine completely. All right. So thank you very much. And I wish you all the very best for the upcoming FMG exam on January 28th. Okay. So you need to be mentally strong in these last few days because it is the mental status which will uh, give you uh, a success for your FMG exam. If you are mentally weak, if you are confidence is low, then there is a high scope that you may land up in failure. So you be with positive attitude and be ensured that you will definitely clear the exam, right? So be hopeful and don't read anything new now. Try to revise the topics which has already been, which you have already read previously. Don't try to experiment with any new topics in this last three, four days that you are having, right? And try to revise as much as possible, mainly the clinical subjects and the major subjects, I mean to say. When you try to revise more and more with the major subjects, at least you will be able to cross that 150th mark. Okay, that is very important for us, right? So thank you very much. And I wish you all the very best for the upcoming FMG exam on January 20th. Thank you very much.